Well, if you've been around here very long, you know that I don't typically do uh, topics that are themed on holidays. For example, on Mother's Day, I've promised never to preach from Proverbs 31. It just makes every woman feel inadequate. And, and, and besides, the woman doesn't actually exist. The passage starts by saying, who can find a woman like this? And the answer is no one. That, that person doesn't exist. Um, by the way, I wanted to say, too, just before we get started this morning, welcome back to all of our college students. Uh, we just feel like the IQ goes up in the room when you're around, so thank you for that. Yeah. So what would be a gospel view of work? And uh, there's two passages. There's so many in Scripture I could, I could go to, and I will refer to a few this morning, but uh, there's a couple of passages I wanted just, just to kind of form our beginning point for how we're going to talk about this conversation. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And then in Ecclesiastes 9, it says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our work or our labor and I started with a couple of questions. Do Christians think differently about work than people of other faiths or people of no faith? Uh, do Christians work differently than people of other faiths or no faith? Like if you are a dentist, can another dentist tell, oh, that was filled by a Christian? Because I can see a little cross in the filling there. Is, it, is, is that, I mean, do Christians really do the work differently? And uh, I don't think that's, that's the case. Yet I think we're often frustrated by the work that's required of us, by a lack of appreciation, by the stress that it brings, or even by the things that we hope it will accomplish that seem to regularly disappoint us. And so I'd like us to just spend a few minutes reforming our thoughts about the things that we do that help provide for our needs. And the first thing I want you to see is that in the beginning, there was work. In the beginning, there was work. We start out with chaos, and God goes to work. In fact, we are introduced to God as a worker, which is radically different from most other religions. Most other religions, the gods never work. The humans work for them, but gods don't work. But he does work. He creates. We're actually introduced to a seven-day seven work week. That, that was God's idea, and one out of those seven he actually rests on. Jesus would say this in John, the fifth chapter. He would say, my father is always at work, and I too am working. This, this idea that there is work. And by the way, in case you think that God's work was really only just giving orders, like light be, uh, what we also see is that God, it tells us, formed humans out of the dust of the ground. We serve a God who's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Not only does he work, but when God created humans, he gave them work to do. That's right. Paradise included work. I know some of you are already disappointed, and some of you are rethinking your eternal destinies. So will there be work in heaven? Most religions consider paradise to be a work free zone, like the ultimate retirement package. And the Bible provides a very different view. God did not consider work to be beneath him, and in fact, he does consider work necessary for human flourishing. Uh, if you are a parent, or if you can remember back when you were a child, there was something that uh, you were probably exposed to or presented to your children called chores. Chores. And different parents have different ways of imposing this. Some parents will reward you for chores done. You might have come in a home where, where there were lists that were kept on the refrigerator. And, and so uh, certain privileges or rewards would be based on that. Uh, maybe you were raised in a home where uh, if you want to eat today, then this is what's expected from you. But as a parent, the reason that you assign chores is not because your child could do a better job or do it more quickly than you can. 
That's never the case. You can always do it better, and you can always do it faster than your child. The reason you assign chores to your children is not to offload work. The reason you assign chores to your children is because you want them to learn diligence. That when you start a thing, you can complete a thing. You want them to learn responsibility, that there's ways to carry your own weight in this world. You want to develop their character. And these are absolutely essential qualities. So when God gives work to humans, it's not just because he thinks humans can do it better or more efficiently than he can. It's because there are things that he wants to develop in them. And apart from work, it doesn't happen. And the Bible's not against rest or leisure. In fact, it actually suggests, recommends, you could even say imposes that at least one out of every seven days would be given to rest, in order to keep us from overwork, because overwork is not a spiritual value. So in Genesis, we learn that work kind of shows up in two ways. One is the work of creation, making something new. But there's also the work of caring, which is, is taking care of something that has been created. You see, a lot of our world was actually developed in, in, or created in an undeveloped state. It had a lot of potential. And the way potential is realized in our world is through work. And uh, if, if you, anybody here ever try to uh, have a garden, anybody would say that you were reasonably good at it? I, uh, I tried once. Um, I, I was worried that I could be brought up before the, the, the world court on planticide because uh, just about nothing I had any involvement with was able to survive or produce fruit. But there's a term that we use for gardens, and it's called cultivate. It, it is, it is the, the things you do to help something grow in the garden. There's a word that's used to describe work that a society does to help things grow, and it's culture. It comes from the same word. The purpose of culture is to help things grow in our society. Work is not a curse. It actually helps us grow things and realize its potential. Now, some people see work as a curse, and some people misread Genesis to, to read that, you know, once humans sin, then God, God cursed them with work. That's not what happened. Once humans sin, work became a lot harder, and we got a lot less reward for the effort that we were putting in. But if we have the view that work is a curse, then a couple of things occur that are really unhealthy. The first is, is that we will tend to see ourselves as slaves. And uh, if you see yourself as a slave, there are certain options you will never consider in life that are absolutely essential to your well-being. But the other thing that can happen is, is that we will tend to treat others as slaves. And not only is that not good for them, it's not good for us either. And so Genesis does not re in any way reveal to us that work is a curse. In Genesis, humans are given a job to do. What's interesting is that animals and plants are not. The only ones given jobs are humans. Animals and plants are given the capacity to reproduce, but humans are given work to do. So when it comes to work, work is the capacity to take raw elements and create something that's beneficial or beautiful, right? This is what we do with our work. For example, if you're a farmer, you take the raw elements of seed and dirt, and you're able to cultivate fruit so that people uh, benefit from that, and, and uh, you can be nourished and sustained. You can take the raw elements of sounds and, and put them together in such a way that it creates music that can be beautiful, and it can be memorable, and it can be meaningful. A lot of our emotions uh, are attached to certain songs because they had meaning at a season of our life, and those are very powerful things. Now, that's not to suggest that every song is beautiful, but at least there's the potential for that. We can take fabric. And, and we can construct it into something that, that not just covers human beings to protect them from the elements, because we've gone way beyond that. We actually make fashion choices. You made a fashion choice when you came here today. Uh, when you looked in the mirror, you said, that's what I'm going to wear today. Uh, uh, I actually did not make a fashion choice today. <laughs> My wife made a fashion choice for me today, because I don't tend to do so well with that. Uh, we, can, we can teach, we can take the raw elements of knowledge and information and we can train young minds to be able to navigate challenges in our world in productive ways. We can take someone with a mechanical ability and give them 
raw tools and, and, and materials, and they can produce machines or repair them to help us accomplish a lot more than we can do without them. Uh, an investment banker. Some people think investment banking is, is some great sin in our world. Uh, they can actually invest in others to create new jobs and new products and a better quality of life. That, that can be used in very powerful ways. Business can actually be a way to cultivate our creation. So when we think about this, this expands our thinking beyond just the only thing God calls people to do is, is religious activity. If, if you were to start thinking about what God might call someone to do, most people say, oh, maybe a pastor or a priest, a, a, a teacher in a children's classroom, a, a musician or a vocalist in worship. We tend to think about what happens in spaces like this. But what scripture reveals to us is that God actually assigns work that is not just limited to religious environments. And all of it has the tendency to both create and care for what has been created. And that's an essential thing to happen in our world. So there are some misuses of work. There, there are ways that we can misuse this opportunity to produce. And one is we try to use work to establish our worth that we try to use what we do or what we make to prove our value in society and in our world. And of course, that's great as long as you get the job you want and the compensation you want, but as soon as that gets threatened, uh, your house of cards begins to collapse. And so work is not supposed to be the source of our worth, and work is not supposed to be just to serve ourselves. The purpose of work is not to see what I can get. I've, I've been in some really nice restaurants in my life. I was in a restaurant one time where I had three wait staff waiting on me at the same time. I mean, there almost wasn't room for me at the table. And it was a wonderful experience. And there's a part of the human heart that just thinks like, this shouldn't just happen when I'm in a restaurant. This should happen everywhere I go. And that's not good. That the purpose of work is not to get other people to serve us. The purpose of work is for us to be able to serve others, to create and care for what has been created. And then we can misuse work to try to elevate our status, to make us appear better. There's a story, it's also in Genesis, it's, it's the story of Babel, where, where people had actually made a technological advancement. They were able to, to make bricks now. They just didn't use stones to build. They were able to make bricks, and so this meant they could build a lot higher. And they decided that they were going to build a tower that reached to the heavens, and this is what they said about it, so we can make a name for ourselves. And what scripture reveals is that if you're trying to use work to make a name for yourself, you're misusing the concept. And so you're going to constantly be frustrated by that. You know, when you look at people, some people think, well, people are proud of being rich and they're proud of being good looking and they're proud of being clever. It's not true. They're not proud of any of those things. They're proud of being richer than someone else. They're proud of being cleverer than someone else. They're proud of being better looking than someone else. That's where pride begins to work its way in. And so we have to think about this in terms of our worldview. Now, worldviews will tend to ask certain questions. Our worldview is going to determine how we think, which determines how we live, and that will determine the kind of culture that we're using to develop our society. So uh, the challenge with uh, um, our worldviews is that they have to answer basic three, three basic questions. And the first question is this. What should our world be like? Because I don't know anybody that looks at the world and goes, it's perfect the way it is. Don't change a thing. There's injustice. There's poverty. There's war. There, even on the good side of things, like if you've ever been to the Temple of the Golden Arches and you purchase something called a Happy Meal, it actually does not make you happy forever. It can only keep a child happy for a few minutes. That there's something very fleeting about our capacity to enjoy even the good things in life. They, they seem temporary and fading. And so the first thing about a worldview is to ask, what should our world be like? And then the second question is, who or what is responsible for it not being right? 
Like, there's got to be a villain in the story, right? There's, there's someone or something that's responsible for this thing going wrong. And, and then the third question is, what can be done to make it right? What strategies are we going to employ? What, what uh, actions are we willing to take in order to make this better? And uh, so worldviews kind of determine how our culture lives. And, uh, and worldviews do one of a couple of things, or actually they do both of these things. And the first is that they always demonize something. If you're going to have a worldview, something or someone has to be at fault for the world not being what it is. Right? So if you're Marx and you're developing a concept called communism, then the one that's at fault is greedy capitalists, that the reason the world is suffering and there's not a better distribution of wealth is because there are people who are too greedy and they're in control, and so they are the enemy, and something must be done about them. Or if you're Sigmund Freud, the idea is, is that the, the source of suffering in the world today is because there are, there are deep desires that we have that are being repressed. Who are they being repressed by? By the moral gatekeepers, by the religious people of our society, and they must be overthrown because they're the bad people. Or maybe you come from, uh, a lot of religions actually fall under the Greek and Plato concept. Plato thought that all of the suffering and problems of the world by, were caused by wicked and lazy, slothful people who were not responsible. And if they would just get up off their duffs and do their job, then the world would be a better place. And here's the problem with all of those worldviews is it requires us to demonize someone. And then it causes us to idolize someone or something else. For Marx, it was now the idolization of a totalitarian state. That is what will fix everything. Or for Sigmund Freud, it was the overthrow of religious and moral institutions so that we could live in unrepressed free life. There's the idol, the unrepressed. Nobody can tell me what to do. Won't you feel better? Or if you come from the Plato background, the idea is just a moral and, and religious revival. We just need more rules. I wish that worked. You know what happens when you make more rules? You have to build more jails. Doesn't fix anything. And so this is the problem with our world views. So when we come to the gospel, the gospel gives us a worldview and it surprises us. It starts out by telling us that the whole world is good. That that's how it started out. Look at creation. God ends the days of creation by saying it was good until he got to humans. And then he said that was really good. I mean, God was proud of the work that he had done. But the second thing is, is that the whole world is fallen. And rather than finding a class or a group, or a structure, or an institution, what the gospel reveals is that sin has invaded our world, and it has contaminated everything. It's contaminated rule keepers. It's contaminated rule breakers. It's contaminated every economic system you can possibly devise. We, we can't create an economic system in our world that is absent of corruption. Humans are incapable of doing it. And so what Scripture reveals is that sin is what has come in and infiltrated this good world that God has created, and then the whole world will be redeemed. This is really important because the idea in lots of religions is that, that only certain parts of us can be redeemed, maybe the spiritual part of us. So the spiritual part of us kind of goes on and everything else decays and it's not worth anything. And, and what God reveals is, is that he's come to redeem, restore, to renew all of us, spirit, soul, and body. That our world will be restored. It will be rebuilt. That God intends good things for what he has made. This is a really intriguing way to think. So then it helps us think about how we approach our jobs. So how should we approach our jobs? If, if the, the whole world is good and the whole world has fallen, and the whole world will be redeemed, how can I think about the work that I do? And what I would tell you is start by just recognizing that the talents and the skills that you have are actually given to you by God. You may have done the work to develop them, but the gift originated from God. And, and so if you are artistic, you are. I'm not. If you are mechanical, you know, I can bring you a bag of bolts and parts and you'll put it together. I can get it apart. I can't get it back together. That's, I have the spiritual gift of, 
of dismantling things. <laughs> but I don't have the spiritual gift of putting stuff back together. I'm not good at that. You can have people who are artistic, people who are musical, people who have all kinds of skills. And we can start with this understanding that this skill, this ability was a gift that was given to me by God. And here's something that we need to think about. This is a gospel worldview, right? God didn't just distribute those gifts to people who already believe in him. Since he's restoring the whole world, that's what he wants to do. He wants to redeem all of it. He's willing to invest gifts to people who've never even considered anything about him yet. And so you may never have heard the name of Jesus. You may never spend a single moment of your entire life inside of a religious environment. And God will still give you gifts and skills and abilities that can be developed. Because when you do them, things are created and creation is cared for. God is incredibly, radically generous in that regard. Or you can think about um, uh, how, how you can use your work to fight chaos. Chaos is what happens. It, it's, the, it's the law of entropy, right? I think if I remember back to my uh, junior high days, it's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything leads to increasing disorder. That's what happens in our world. Chaos is what happens when, when we feel afraid. And chaos is what happens when we feel like we're not in control. You can walk into a doctor's office and they can give you a diagnosis or a prognosis that means your life is limited or maybe even unsustainable over much time. And suddenly you will feel like you've entered into chaos. And in our world, there's, there's all these ways that chaos can break in. Uh, for example, if you are a mom of young children, dear God, it's nothing but a fight against chaos. I mean, just the diapers, they fill alone in a day. It's unbelievable. And have you noticed children automatically, it's like they've got my spiritual gift for dismantling. They just, they take lots of things apart and lots of things out of their place. But man, you got to train them to put something back. How about sanitation workers? Can you imagine how overrun with disease and filth and vermin our society would be if we didn't have people who fought against the chaos of garbage and just help get it to a place where it can't do any more damage? It is astonishing to me how often we don't recognize how what we are doing is actually serving the created order. And because someone does a job we would prefer not to do, we actually value them less. If they didn't, all the jobs we don't like are the ones that are making the biggest difference in our lives. Just because we don't pay them a lot doesn't mean it's not worth something to us. Just go ahead and let some of those people stop doing their jobs and see what happens to our wonderful lives. Man, treat everybody with some respect and some dignity. Identify ways to encourage growth, right? I can grow in my understanding of, of myself, of, of God, of, of how, to, how to be a, a person who interacts and relates with others better, how to build relationships instead of tear them down. Uh, if, if you're in teaching profession, you can help grow the young minds that have been entrusted to your care. Uh, we can grow ourselves. And, and here's the thing. We don't have to beat the world down to make things better. Sometimes you can make things better just by smiling. Let, let's all try it one time. I want you to look at the person next to you and give your best effort at a smile right now. Just, I'm not going to ask you to rate it. Just, yeah, see? There you go. I, I was in a, a, a fast food restaurant, which tells you something, right? I didn't go there for good food. I went there for fast food. And they were understaffed that day, and the line was out the door. And I knew this was going to take a while. And so I stood there, and I watched frustrated people who came for the same thing I did, to get a quick source of nutrition, and we used that term lightly. <laughs> and it wasn't happening. And they were understaffed that day. And you know the person on the other side of that counter, if they're making minimum wage, that's good, right? That's all they're getting out of this. And people are just frustrated. And they don't seem to be moving fast enough. So I get up to the line, and the first thing I do is I just smile. <laughs> and, and they look at me like, what's wrong? <laughs> and I said, how's your day going? And she looked at me, and she says, you don't want to know. I said, I know, and I'm sorry. I wish you had more help, but I think you're doing a great job 
with all that you've got. And so thank you. I really appreciate it. And I'll take, you know. And you could watch her posture changed. Her shoulders went, she felt better. Nothing changed. They didn't bring in any extra work. They didn't give her a race. Nothing changed. But something got better. That's what can happen when, when we have a mindset to, to fight chaos. We have a mindset to help grow others. And we have a mindset just to identify ways that, that we can care for what God has made. Going that extra half mile, that, that, that little smile, all of these things make a huge difference. And then just show respect for others. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me a lot these days is the idea that some people of faith have if a person doesn't agree with your positions, you have a right to be unchristian towards them. And we don't. Not ever. The basis of a person's value is not because they think like us. It's, been, it's because they were created in the image and the likeness of God. And that's reason enough to be respectful to them. That's reason enough. Treat them like a human being created in the image and likeness of God. So... Jesus came into our world with work to do. And in John 5, he said, I'm always working. And we see him working in many ways. And we see him finally complete his work. And we know this because he says, it is finished. At the cross, he completed all the redemptive work necessary for us to be renewed and restored back to God. The price was paid. But in his resurrection, he enables us to continue the work that he began there. That we now become the carriers of grace, of light into darkness. That bring hope where there is hopelessness. That we help restore God's intended purpose in our world. And we can do that through our work. Through his resurrection, he shows us how to carry the influence of grace wherever we go. Now, there are lots of people in our world who have not yet had a personal experience of grace. And what I can tell you is... Uh, they're starting to lose hope. Uh, we're seeing more evidence that people are giving up and quitting. In every sphere you, can, you care to account for that. And God says that's why grace communities are so important. Because there are work that they are doing that's important in our world. They're pushing back chaos. They're creating new things. They're caring for what has already been created. And God says there's value in that. And if he values it, it just makes a lot of sense that we would too. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, I just ask that for this next portion of our service that you would just help us to be willing to do some work right now. In Jesus' name. So if you look at the back of your notes, there's actually three things. We're going to try a little prayer work this morning, a little work we're going to do. And the first is this. You'll see a phrase that says, Heavenly Father, we will have many little children here next Sunday. Would you? And what I'd like to do right now is just take about 15 seconds and complete that sentence, something you would like God to do for those little children that are here next Sunday, because we're going to have a multitude of them. And so just write down. Uh, take out a pen, take out a pencil, and just, just write it down. What would you like... God to do for little kids. Maybe you just want them to be safe or feel safe. Maybe you'd like them to be exposed to some truth that it's like a light comes on and life makes more sense to them. Maybe they develop a good friend, some connection, just something you'd like to see happen. And just write that down. The next one says, God, for those who come and have not yet personally experienced your grace yet, what would you like for them? I mean, you have to know, right? There are people who are going to be here that are very apprehensive. They have assumptions and expectations about church environments that aren't all that good. And just because they're being gracious to an invitation, they're going to show up. So what would you like to happen for them? What would you like God to do for them? So just 
write, write down a sentence. And the last one is this. God, I'm willing to. So if, if you're going to be here, maybe that's what you're willing to do. I'm, I'm willing to be here. Or I'm willing to warmly greet people that maybe I'm not familiar with or don't know yet. Or maybe I'm willing to volunteer. Just something you're willing to do. Just letting God know I'm, I'm available. I will help. If there's something you want me to do, I'll do it. I'll just give you a, a few seconds to write that down. All right, now, if I, if I could have everyone stand up. If you don't know, prayer is actually work. And so we're going to do a little work today. And, uh, and what we're going to do is our prayers are going to be something that we say out loud. We're going to do a little experiment today. So I want to do a little sound check. Let's, let's go back to this one, all right? Let's just say the two, first uh, two words together. Ready? Heavenly Father. That is fantastic. <laughs> you guys are good, all right? Now... We're going to say this whole phrase together. Heavenly Father, will you, we will have many children here next Sunday. Would you? And then when we get to the would you, I want you to read what you wrote you would like God to do for those children on that day. And, and here's the thing. This is what we'll be tempted to do. Would little children here next Sunday, would you? i will just kind of go under. And would you please hear me right now? Prayer is work. But it's work that matters. And there are some things that God goes to work on when we've done our work. And there's way too much at stake for us not to do our work. So we're going to go through each of these. And when we get to the portion, I just want you to read your sentence. And then we'll go to the next one, and we'll read your sentence. And we'll go to the last one to read your sentence. And then I'll just close this out with a quick prayer. Ready? Let's start this together. Heavenly Father... We will have many little children here next Sunday. Would you? God, for those who come and have not yet personally experienced your grace yet, God, I am willing to. Heavenly Father, our work is nothing in comparison to the work that you do, but it is similar. We work to create, and we work to care for what you have created, and we ask you to be at work next Sunday in every moment of our time together so that even more may come to know of your grace. And all who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. You may be seated this morning. <clears throat> 